Thank you, Hannah Beth. Turn with me over to the book of Matthew. We're going to continue our series on the parables of Christ. By the way, as Pastor Donnell mentioned next week, we're going to take our next offering. The next offering is that which gives us the privilege of supplying resources to all of our church plants and resources to those who are going to be next in church planting. Well, Pastor Donnell and Sean Perkins happen to be our next church plant. And as a result, we're going to take an offering for them next week. Uh, I did not want her to share that because it sounds very self-serving, but I am pushing it. So when you come next week, make sure you come next week ready to give in our next offering. Meaning, bring your wallets with you. Okay? And we have a program that allows you the privilege of growing up a little faster than you would on your own. It's called Lead Well. It's our version of of a small Bible training center that equips you with the basics of systematic theology, understanding who we are as a people, the foundations of the faith, and who you are, and how you can develop your ministry gifts and know what they are so that you can be best deployed wherever you are. Not talking about full-time ministry, though those who go through it, many of them will be called. But you could be called to stay exactly where you are in the area of occupation where God has called you. But we, we still want you to be a minister. And so this program called Lead Well is two years. It allows you the privilege of under, understanding better everything I just said. It is fabulous. So I'd like you, if you want to participate, to email us at leadwell at gracecove.org. Leadwell at gracecove.org. And you'll have the privilege of understanding a little bit more about how to get to your, your ministry destination, destination and your purpose destination a little bit faster. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Matthew 13, verse 44. Continuing with the parables of Christ, the title of the message is The Kingdom Way, Buying the Field. Jesus is speaking, and he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again. And and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Lord, help us as we study your word today. There are three things in this passage about which I want to talk to you. One is what it means to have treasure that is unearthed, discovered. Two, what it means to have treasure that you are willing to sell everything for. And three, what it actually means to buy that treasure. Jesus is doing what he can to try to help the people of the day, the Israelites, know what kingdom reality looked like, looked like here. Not so much what it meant to get to heaven, though heaven was a destination for all who love him. It was not the primary focus of the Israelites in that day to try to figure out how they could get a reservation in glory. It was more about how in the world can I manage here Rome hates us. They've got their foot on our neck. Our religious leaders do do what they can, I guess, to try to help, but really their help is hurt. They're in it for the most part for themselves. They don't care about the the general populace. They put more burdens on us with respect to the law that, that either we or they can bear. They're not helping us at all. Jesus, you're the Messiah. They didn't know what It all meant in reality for him to be the Messiah, but they knew that he was the promised one. So many of them did. And they followed him in droves to try to figure out what kind of kingdom he would establish. They were hoping it would be one that would unseat Rome and all of their present religious leaders in the Jewish community and establish a kingdom much like David. But Jesus' kingdom was a little bit different because when David had his kingdom, it was was called the kingdom of David. That's how they would label it. So it would be labeled according to the monarch that happened to be sitting on the throne at the time. So the kingdom of Solomon, who came after David, or the kingdom of Rehoboam, who came after Solomon. Many of those kings were good in the kingdom of Judah. When it separated and became two kingdoms, the northern and southern kingdom, the northern kingdom didn't have one good king, not one. They had one that wasn't bad, named Jehu, but but all of them were messed up, did things really bad kingdom of Judah, probably about half, a third to a half that were really good. None of them exemplary, none of them without flaw. Uh, The one who probably was the best was David. Thus, this is why they called Jesus the son of David and that it was prophesied through David that the Messiah would come. He would be the one through whom this person would have a, a throne and that throne would never be relinquished and a kingdom 
uh, a kingdom whose end would never see, an, uh, never see an end and would always expand. And so they, they called Jesus the son of David, believing he was that Messiah. So they were looking for him to set up a kingdom of Jesus on the earth. But Jesus did not come talking about his own personal kingdom with respect to his humanity. He came talking about the kingdom of God. He didn't print up business cards and say, monarch on the earth. He was talking about the kingdom of heaven. Now, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, same thing, just different way to describe this realm of rulership. And it wasn't going to be one that the people would readily accept as that which would deliver them in a hurry from everything they thought they needed to get free from. The political regimes that existed that day and the religious system that kept them under uh, a, a, a heavy yoke that they could not bear. It was going to be a kingdom that allowed them to bear all the things that they thought were too heavy. It was going to be something that would change them on the inside, not necessarily change their circumstances. Yet, the changing them on the inside would necessarily change their circumstances, though it would be different in that the kingdom would advance, not their agenda. And so Jesus was doing everything he could to try to help them understand what this kingdom looked like. And here, he's talking relationally. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who found a treasure in a field. When he found it, he went and hid it again and, and went back to find, find all his possessions and, and realized this treasure is so valuable. I need to get everything I've got, sell it, and buy that field. Now, we don't know whether this treasure was a buried treasure, meaning a box that had a lot of stuff in it that was so valuable that the guy thought, I'm going to rebury it and then go out and sell everything I got to try to buy the field. Or it was like a guy who happens to find a cave and he looks up with a candle because he's trying to get some illumination and he finds this vein of gold running through it and he realizes, oh my goodness, I've struck it rich. Nobody even knows this is here. They're not mining this. It's buried treasure, but it's natural. We don't know which. We do know this that whatever he found was valuable. Now, this is a story that Jesus is telling in order to convey a point. So he's crafting the story so that people could best understand a larger principle. And the principle is not so much that the vein of gold or the treasure that was buried, a box with stuff on the inside, was actually representative of the kingdom, though you can always apply it that way. I think what he was trying to convey is there is a kingdom process that allows you to find stuff of value that others ignore that others do not see. They've not noticed what's there, but you can see it if you are kingdom-minded, if you're kingdom-oriented. The kingdom of heaven is like this story I'm telling you. And I'm telling you, you got to have some new eyes to see kingdom stuff and the stuff that Jesus decided to see kingdom in. You have to have a whole new vision perspective to value things that most people don't. <laughs> so here we have... The scenario, and I'm going to take all of this parable and put it into two categories. One category where Jesus is looking at, 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 at what he needs to survey and how he sees value in stuff that most don't. And then what we need to do in terms of seeing value in things that we would ignore, both in our own personal experience that, that guides us toward righteousness and relationship with God and our own personal experience that guides us in right relationship with humanity. Jesus looks at the world, and he sees value, value. He looks at Brett, and he sees value. I look at Brett and sometimes don't. I see all my flaws. I see the, the, <laughs> yep, men, you remember when you were buying a diamond for your bride? And they had all the, the different categories, A, B, C, D, grades of color, and then you had you're not following me. I don't feel you following me in this. Please, just stay with me. If I'm educating some of you, just stay with me in this. And then they've got clarity. And, and they've got VVS2, VS1, and, and very slight imperfection at different grades. And then you get all the way up to where there's a thing called flawless, where, where when you look at the stone that they have carved out in whatever shape they've carved it, there are no imperfections. And if you can get it in a certain color that doesn't reflect anything but white light, 
And the grading of the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H is all about which way the color grade goes. So if you go down, you wind up more, is it down? A is worse, H is good. That's what I thought. A, you get A, you basically got a, a little brownstone is what you got. <laughs> Very nice. It could be flawless, but you could get that in a gumball machine for the most part. <laughs> but you get all the way over here in H and, and you keep going, it's, it's white light. And so you're trying to reflect the light that's supposed to be in it without any diversion out, both with, whether it be through clarity or whether it be through color. You don't want the light to change. And when you get a stone like that, whoo, whoo, it, it's not a $1,500 moment, gentlemen. <laughs> It is not. It is not. Depending on the size, the larger the stone, the, lar the, 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 the better the color, and the fewer imp imperfections, the greater the price. And it's exponential in how it rises with respect to the size of the stone. Well, I, you know, when God tried to reflect light through bread, it didn't come out like it came in. It was diffracted all over the place. Folk couldn't see what in the world I was saying. And it was the wrong color. Not talking about black, white. Don't, don't go there. That's not. I'm talking about the purity that should have come in did not come out. It was clouded with all kinds of junk. What we're trying to do is see value in flawed stuff. Because nobody, I mean, if they really love their bride, no guy is trying. And I know they make chocolate stones, but... but <laughs> I don't know any woman who wants one. I, <laughs> what's this? <laughs> Aside from the new way of, of looking at, by, the general sense is that nobody wants to give their woman a stone that was out of a bum, bubble gum machine. Something that doesn't look right, doesn't refract light right, doesn't do anything the way it's supposed to. Now, if you're a man who's just trying to make it through, like I was when I got my bride, I mean, I, I didn't have any money. So I, 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 got, a, I got a fleck. I don't know. A fleck, fleck is the little stuff they cut off the diamond <laughs> to make it better. That was the thing I gave my bride. I was only making $5,000 a year. That's it in ministry. And I was happy. I wasn't complaining. And yes, $5,000 a year was as much nothing then as it is now. <laughs> Don't think that somehow it translates 40 years ago into 150. No, it was nothing. It was nothing. But I was happy with nothing. But I didn't have anything. So I got her literally a quarter of a carat. A quarter of a carat. I understand. You get what you can. But you do what you can to try to give the most value. And you try not to diminish the moment by giving something that would be considered less than. When you have all the resources possible, when you have anything you can pos if you don't have, if you don't like what you see, you can remake it. If you're God Almighty, why work with us? If he could redo this thing all over again, why work with us? Why? Why look at this project that's going to not just be hard to do, but cost you everything? Because he sees buried treasure on the inside of you. The image of God is special. Hallelujah. I realize we've all messed it up. It's hard for you to see in the mirror what God thought about when he thought about creating you because you've messed it up so much, I've messed it up so much, I get it. But he sees something very different. He sees value in you. Inestimable value. So great is the value that he gave something priceless for your benefit, his own life. I don't get it because I don't see it. It's covered up with a whole lot of dirt. The dirt of my life in sin, my selfishness, my anger, 
my tendency to always want things to go my way and so manipulating circumstances so that people will perceive me the right way, my line, all those things that I would think would disqualify me from being somebody that could be valued. He saw beneath the dirt and said, you're mine and I'm going to pay for you. I'm going to pay to get you right. He's amazing. Amazing. And so he, un, he was able to see beneath all the junk, the dirt, and, and find the value. Of, and, and remember, I always get a lot of flack when I do this, but it, it needs to be said. He died for all of creation, but he specifically died for people who happened to be made in his image, for people, things made in his image. All of creation benefits. But he came as a man, died for men, because they're made in his image. And that is the thing he values the most. It's not that he doesn't value the animal creation, because they all benefit. But he, he, didn't, he didn't die specifically for those things that are not made in his image. That's the thing for which he gave his life. And that's the thing we need to prioritize the most in our willingness to give ourselves and so there is a huge distinction between humanity and animal kingdom. Huge. Not saying you can't love your dog. Love your dog. Treat your dog right. He's not a family member. <laughs> not a family member. But treat your dog right. Care for your dog. And remember, your dog does not want to be your family member. He just likes being your servant. That's the way they're wired. But there's something different about humanity, and we need to treat humanity differently. Yes. And, but the reason we don't is because we see so much dirt. We see the dirt, we don't see the value. And, 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 and with animals, see, they don't talk, so they don't show their dirt. Oh, if your dog could talk. <laughs> oh, if your dog could talk. He'd be at the pound next week. <laughs> next week. What? This, you feed me this slop again? You don't eat the same thing every day. You feed your dog to say, hey, 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 hey. I want some blue, what do they call blue? Uh, pedigree, I want some pedigree up in here. Fido got some last week. <laughs> People are different. They should be valued different. And Jesus thought so much of us that he gave his benefit his life, all that he had for us. So he saw the value. And then he said, I'm willing to sell everything in order to get them. The treasure meant that much to him. This, this is kingdom reality. This is how the kingdom works. It's the only way that we can find the, the greatest amount of security in the earth is to realize that we are not valued for what we do, but for who we are. Now, we, we add benefit to the world by what we do, but it doesn't bring value, greater value to us from God because he valued us even when we were messed up and thought we were worth paying the ultimate price. You can't get any more valuable than that in his eyes. So no matter what you do, you cannot esteem your value. You can make him happier by what you do. And there's a difference between being accepted and bought and then being approved. Being accepted really comes without strengths. No deeds attached. He just loves you for no good reason at all. Love from God, love the way it's supposed to be ministered to people, by people, should make no sense at all. It's not logical. You just decide to love somebody even if they don't love you back. Because love is a commitment. Agape is the word in Greek. And it means to love without condition. So if somebody doesn't love you the way you love them, so? It doesn't matter. You still love them because your love was not dependent on how they responded. 
You're not looking for any reciprocation from them. That's the way love is. If it has any conditions, it's not the God kind of love. It doesn't mean that it's not better than dislike or hate. And so anything that's better than those two, I'm for. But you have not yet moved into the supernatural realm of, of ministering to other people like God ministered to you until you can really receive that which God gave you and give it to somebody else. Amen. Freely you have received, freely give. So it's our responsibility to be conduits of what he has given us to others, not reservoirs, rivers. And we need to be trained to understand how he loved us so much why he loved us so much, and then love people the same way. We were made in his image. He didn't love us because of what we did. He loved, us, he loved us because of who we were. And as a result, he wasn't going to take that love back. He gave his life for our benefit and brought us into his kingdom. Didn't just make us servants, made us sons and daughters, and said, listen, now I want you to treat other people like I treated you. And the, the stuff he had to give up, in order to put himself in a position to be able to purchase. Wow. He's, he's God, Jesus is God. It, 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 there's almost, it's almost not theological, theologically sensible to ever talk about Jesus and God in terms of was and past tense because he always has been. It's not like he stopped being. He's always been God and by definition, Whoever is God always has to be God, always has to have been God, and never will stop being God, because God can't be made, nor can he be destroyed. That's the definition of God. So if he can't be made and he can't be destroyed, then whatever form he chooses to appear in doesn't mean that he started at being God at that time. He was God before. He was seated on the throne. He was the son of the Trinity. He was the one who had all things made through him, by him, and for him. He created all that we know to be as a result of the Father's inspiration. The Trinity works like that. God, the Father was the CEO. Jesus was, excuse me, God the Father was chairman of the board, Jesus CEO, and, and, and the Holy Spirit was the executive director, if you want to put it like that. Bad analogy, but at least if you're a businessman, you understand. <laughs> He's always been God. And being always God, he had privileges that none of us have ever experienced. Omniscience, all-knowing, never not knowing anything. Hallelujah. Omnipotence, all power, never ever experiencing weakness. And the kind of power that is infinite in its orientation. It doesn't have a cap or a ceiling. And all present, he's everywhere at once. There's no place he has never been. And even the places we don't know what are, he's there. He decided, I give up all that privilege without giving up his person. Because you can't, if you are God, you cannot stop being God. Without giving up his person, he gave up his privilege and said, I choose to become a man in order to save them. He gave up all that, all of it. Decided to become confined to a little human body. You talk about claustrophobia. <laughs> you get really weird on a plane or a bus he who filled the universe was now like this. And again, it's oxymoronic to talk about God and claustrophobia because he has no fear. But I wanted you to understand how difficult it is to go from that to this. For the first time, become needy. He never experienced hunger. Now he was. He never experienced weakness. Now he did. He never experienced not knowing everything. But now he was as ignorant as you could be as a human baby, needing to be taught by his parents. He gave up all that in order to, to be what he needed to be to reach us. He decided to sell everything he had because he cared about us. And he realized this was the only way to make it happen. He saw the treasure in the field. And the dirt did not dissuade him from the treasure. The dirt dissuades us from the treasure. We see the dirt in people's lives and say, hey, Megan, that's sacrifice. 
Mm -mm -mm. No, I can find some different kind of friends. No, 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 no. Not going to take too much time. High maintenance folk. Mm, no, I'm not going that direction. I'm going the direction in which I, I can live out my life with ease. We try to find relationships that will love us. That's what we mean when we say, I can't deal right now, too much drama. It's requiring more of me than I'm willing to pay. I don't want to sell what I got to sell to make this thing work. And anybody who's been in a relationship long enough knows it's going to cost you everything. And you don't know what everything is until you realize, I don't want to pay it. Then you know what everything means. Oh, oh, <laughs> Okay, when I said I do, I did not. <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean. I, I wasn't, I wasn't, oh, no, 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 no. No, I ain't cut out for marriage. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> we understand. What, we don't read the fine print because we fall in love. <laughs> oh. oh, she's amazing. She, she, she understands me. She gets me two years later. She doesn't get me at all. <laughs> she says, I'm this, I'm angry, I, I, I don't listen, I don't speak. She doesn't get me at all. I don't know what happened. I don't know how to... And then you ladies, listen. Let, let, me, let me... You are more complicated than we can, we can discern. <laughs> Amen. You are the adventure of our lives to try to figure out who are you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't. And as soon as we think we got to figure it out, you change. <laughs> that's not a criticism. That's just reality. It's just reality. We aren't smart enough. We aren't smart enough to keep up. We men, let me tell you what your frustration is with us. We are the same simple human beings <laughs> That you married. You just can't believe we like it this way. <laughs> what? Really? You don't want to change? No. No. <laughs> I don't want to talk anymore. I don't want to listen anymore. I like my drawers on the floor. I like it this way. You didn't know. You just didn't know you were in love. And you thought, I can deal with that. I can deal with that. Oh, it's just a little flaw. And this is why I'm not big on falling in love. I'm big on growing in love. But when you fall, after you say, I do, you get back up. <laughs> you, you stand on both feet right now. You, you wide-eyed, understanding everything. Falling means that you said, I'm, I'm going to give up all the, all the issues that I might have difficulty with, and I'm going to let my emotions override my good common sense. I'm not going to begin to deal with these things now. We'll get it afterwards, because I care about you so much. <laughs> That's not a smart way to go into relationships. It does pop a bubble, but, but do you want it to pop before or after you're married? Because it's going to pop. The bubble will pop because you are marrying a sinner, a criminal. A criminal in the kingdom of God, you are saying I do to. <laughs> they are really good at breaking every one of God's laws, and they will do it mostly on you. Hear me? Jesus grew in love with us. He didn't fall. He knew exactly what was wrong with us. And he said, I value you anyway. This is, this is what relationships mean. Meaning if you want to be kingdom in your orientation, you're going to have to come into every relationship you have looking at it like God did. Saying, okay, there are serious issues. And realizing this, many of the serious issues that I have with somebody, they have with me. We always like to put the responsibility on somebody else who needs to change for my benefit. But they're thinking, it's you. And so relationships are never 50-50. It's not give and take. 
Because as soon as you think you've given what you need to give, you're sitting around waiting for them to give, and when they don't, you feel like you need to take. And that's when arguments start, because you haven't gotten what you needed. You need to make sure I'm secure. You need to make sure I'm provided for. You need to make sure my soul is filled with acceptance and approval. Where is that? Where, where do you find that written? That's not in the Bible. The only way we get all of our acceptance and approval is if we really relate to God the way we should. Because people will never relate to you the way they should. Ever. Ever. But, but simply because they won't doesn't mean you need to devalue the field. Because there's a treasure in there. There's a treasure in there. And in order to get it, you have to do some digging. You have to deal with a lot of dirt. A lot of, more dirt than you want to. Most, most fields that are mined have to remove a hundred thousand times more dirt than they, than they mine out the value. And you might feel like, boy, I've been shoveling for a long time. <laughs> Woo I've been shoveling for a long time. My goodness. It's worth it. It's worth it. Jesus gave up all of that because he saw value. He saw value. And then he bought it. He gave his life he went to the cross, he sold all he had, and then took what he had, and then purchased us. And it wasn't with finance, it wasn't with just wisdom, it was with his life. He bought us with his life, and the price has not changed. For you to be able to walk with somebody else is going to cost you everything. I'm, ta I'm not talking about walking with him in a way that's measured for a period of time where both of you can have win-wins in life. I'm talking about walking with folk and not stopping. There is nothing about breath that could ever be confused with perfection. I'm as flawed as you get. I am a son of Adam. But, but the son of God, the son of God, who made me a son of God, allows me the privilege of having experienced enough living whereby I am more consistent than I am flawed. And thus, that gives me the privilege of having relationships that I've had for 37 years in the kingdom, none of which I've ever walked away from, not one. Though folks have given me many opportunities, and I have given them. And yet we decided, I'd have to start over with somebody and go through, the, through a different version of Adam, but the same problem with somebody else. And I choose to allow the redemptive benefit that flows from the cross to define my relationship with you rather than the offense that I'm feeling so bad about right now. He, he, he gave me a, a tool belt that has tolerance and forgiveness and all kinds of stuff. I choose to apply that to my relationship with you right now, and I pray that whenever I blow it with you, you would do it with me. I can't make you, but even if you don't, And as a result, I've been able to keep most. I've lost some because I'm so stupid. I've lost some, and I wish I had not. It hurts me when I think about what I did to people and how they don't forgive me. I'm not mad at them. I'm mad at me. But I'm, I'm trying to manage my dirt as best I know how so that I can give value to people. Yeah. This is why Jesus said the only way to live this way the only way to live this way is if you quit being you for a minute. P you want to be my disciple? Pick up your cross and follow me. Die and let me make you new. The old you can't do this. The old you has limits. The old you has, has requirements upon which people can relate to you. And you have all these lines you've drawn in the sand. If you cross that, mm -mm -mm -mm. that's the old you. And the best you can do when somebody offends you is tolerate them. What about forgiving them and restoring them? Because that's what God did with you. Why? Because he saw value. So you go to the cross. You say, Lord, I see the value in the kingdom. I see it. And I realize to get it, it's going to cost me everything. So I choose to be your servant. I choose to give you my life today. That's how you do it with God. 
And the beauty is that, and this is what I don't get as I close. This is what I don't get. I mean, I know I'm just preaching what I said, and sometimes I have to go ahead and look in the mirror while I'm preaching and say, believe what you said, because it's like Bible. Believe it. But this is reality of my humanity. I get right with God. I get all of him. I get his power. I get his goodness. I get his forgiveness so I don't have to suffer for the things I've done wrong. I, I, I get hope for a future that I did not have. I get the ability to have relationships with people that I never would have had otherwise that really care for me. I get to be called his son, not just a servant. I get an inheritance in his kingdom. I get glory forever, and I get to represent him. He actually invests in me the ability to be his ambassador in the earth. I get, I get to be a part of the family business, and I could go on for the next 30 minutes to talk about the benefits I get from dying. And when I think about the juxtaposition, the reciprocal stuff, you get me? How do you win in this? I get all of you. You get. You get me. Oh God, thank you. Thank you for seeing some money inside of me beyond the dirt. Because he values stuff I don't even see. And that's the only way we can show how much we love him and that we are identified with him is if we take what we know to be true about how he, treat, how he treated us and not treat everybody else. See the value and love people when they are unlovable. For God demonstrates, Romans 5, for God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet enemies, sinners, he chose to give himself for our benefit. Love doesn't just talk. It demonstrates. How much do you love people? And how do you love people? The only way, though, to get the treasure is to buy the dirt. You got to take all of me. <laughs> you got to take all of me. You got to take all of me. Every bit of bread, you got to take it. Cynthia bought the dirt. <laughs> Cynthia bought the dirt. My children didn't have a, a choice. They were born in the dirt. <laughs> you got to buy all. You can't just take what you want. You can't do that in the kingdom either. You can't come and say, oh, Lord, let's negotiate this thing. I'd really like to have that eternal thing, that glory thing where I get my reservation in heaven. That'd be nice. But I still want to keep my immorality here. Can we negotiate? No. Die. Pick up your cross. Give, it, give your life. All that you are to me. Everything. Then we can talk. If you don't want to take my, my offer, that's your choice. But there is no negotiation. And when it comes to other people, there's no negotiation with respect to how much you need to give for their benefit. Now, we can't give everything to everybody because we're, we're one human being. But, but in the relational aspects, the, the sphere of, of significant others that are in our lives, we need to give our lives for them. It doesn't mean we don't discuss truth. It doesn't mean we don't have conversations about how things need to be changed. But loving them unconditionally and hanging by them until, until, not until we see them change, just until, hanging by them, staying with them until is a non-negotiable. Because that's what God did for us. They may have offended you to such a degree that they may never be your best friend again. That's not a requirement in the Bible. But it is a requirement that you love them unconditionally. Are you listening to me? Let's pray. Daddy, I love you.